welcome to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. Welcome to this episode of The Fitterist Show. My name is Christopher Allen. I am your host. And on today's show, we examine the correlation between being physically fit and being financially fit. And we're going to look at and discuss six key areas, six parallels between physical fitness and and financial fitness. And I'm particularly excited to start to highlight some of the synergies of what I call this fitterist framework, where the influences from one area, physical fitness and health in this case, have the potential to positively impact another area of one's life, in this case, financial fitness. And as we'll see, some of those behaviors, some of the mindset, and some of the habit formulations are pretty synergistic between these two areas. And before we dive into this, I should probably just state I'm not a doctor, nor am I a financial professional. The information presented here is for informational purposes only, and is based on my personal observations and personal opinions and experience. So let's dive into the six areas. And the format that I'm going to use, I'm going to talk about an area, and then I'm going to apply it to the physical fitness arena and then the financial fitness arena. So the first area is having a strategy and a plan. Seems obvious, but setting a specific goal drive success. So in the physical fitness arena, you may have a goal of, I want to lose X percent of body fat while toning muscle and maintaining that indefinitely. And on the financial side, you may have a specific financial goal. I want to retire at age X with Y dollars, or I want Z dollars in my 401k before I retire. Similarly, understanding what that end goal is, is extremely important. So As an example, training for a marathon is very different than training for a physique competition. And on the financial side, saving for a house down payment, while it's related, is very different than saving for retirement. It could be part of a retirement saving strategy, but it's different. In both cases, the earlier you start, the better your return. On the physical side, your body will respond to consistent training, muscular stimulation, cardiovascular exercise over time. Similarly, on the financial side, the earlier you start, the better the opportunity for compounded return and yield. Your portfolio will respond to investments, particularly as you get older, as you diversify across stocks, bonds, and different funds. Being able to trade off quick, instant success. So on the physical side, that could be anything from liposuction to crash dieting and dropping 10 pounds, trading that off for delayed gratification. The key again to a physical lifestyle change is consistency over time. And on the financial side, it's also similar. Trading off quick and gains and instant riches, whether it's a get quick rich thing or commodity trading. I actually did commodity trading when I was younger and it is a roller coaster ride, not for the faint of heart and generally not recommended as part of a mature portfolio. And one of the most historically proven ways to impact your financial portfolio is having a consistent investment strategy over time. And the last area I'll talk about under the strategy and plan area is motivation. So on the physical side, finding a deeper why, understanding what your why is will be far more valuable and impactful over the long run than surface level stuff. It's always good to, hey, I want to lose 10 pounds for the summer. That's good, but what's going to keep that going on for 10, 20, 30 years? Similarly, on the financial side, having a why will help to drive real changes to your saving, income, and spending portfolio. The number two parallel area between physical and financial fitness is there's no overnight success. The change simply takes time. This is about persistence, about slow and steady wins the race. So on the physical side, being overweight is really around calorie consumption leading to fitness debt. And on the financial side, you have spending habits that lead to kind of financially overweight or financial debt. And overspending is kind of like lifting too much weight where you could hurt yourself if you continue to spend. On the physical side, Exercise, nutrition, sleep are like deposits in your physical health bank. Similarly, on the financial side, cash savings, increased earned income are like deposits or are deposits in your financial bank. 
In both cases, it's important to be undeterred by minor setbacks and plateaus. You're going to have those. They are going to be present. So keeping a vision and longer term thinking so that you can weather the short term market fluctuations will help you in your journey. Also available is drawing inspiration from your successes and building blocks of your success and other people's success stories. And that can happen again on the physical side or on the financial side. On the financial side, you can emulate the success of financially successful people. One of the most influential books that I read very early in my 20s was a book uh, by Thomas Stanley called The Millionaire Next Door. If you get a chance, it's a good read. There's already The Next Millionaire Next Door, which is an updated version of that written by Dr. Stanley's daughter. And I was fascinated with the original Millionaire Next Door book because it just really laid out a blueprint for if you want to become a millionaire, here's how the average person can become a millionaire. Is it easy? Absolutely not. But we're not talking about the Cardi B's and Kanye's and LeBron's of the world. Those That's a different, this is, hence the title, The Millionaire Next Door, and this isn't a reviewer of the book, but it is a great read that really grounds one pragmatically in the steps necessary to become a millionaire. So you can draw inspiration from other success stories as you continue to learn on your journey. And remember that small, continuous changes yield big results over a long period of time. And again, that applies to both physical and financial, small, ongoing, continuous improvements, the power of compounding on the financial side, consistency wins out in the long run. So it, again, no overnight success. Change does take time, but there's a blueprint that you can lay out and set long-term goals to achieve them. The third area between being physically and financially fit is self-discipline. One of my favorite because, first of all, you need to start out with the right mindset. This is not going to work if you're okay with the status quo or you just say, hey, I just want to lose five pounds. Similarly, with the financial side, if, if you, hey, I want to save $100, that's great and it's a good intermediate goal. But if you're really looking at making a lasting change, you need to have the right financial mindset that supports your long-term financial budget and plan. It also requires the development and reinforcement of habits. So on the physical side, nutrition and exercise habits. On the financial side, things like spending habits and savings habits. Self-discipline plays a huge role. On the physical side, with working out and having a consistent diet, can you steer clear of the Oreos that are in your pantry? Or do you need to remove that package of Oreos from your entire residence so you're not tempted? On the financial side, when you get that raise, do you put a down payment on a new Land Rover? Or do you maybe have a much smaller celebration, maybe it's a dinner out, and basically change nothing in your lifestyle and put away and save the entire delta of the raise you just received? And different people are going to have different levels of self-discipline. This gives you an idea of some of the things that, and questions that you might face as you're going through these changes. Also important across both physical and financial is to not get too worried or upset if you stray from the path a little bit, knowing that you can get right back on track. So whether you stray from your diet a little bit or stray from your savings plan, it's always good to have an emergency fund on the saving side for unplanned and unexpected items. So in case you drift a little bit, you have a cushion there. Similarly, it's also important to just stay grounded and realistic. Avoid all the get rich quick schemes. And again, it's slow and steady consistency that wins out over time and let the positive result reinforce your progress. So as you make and you, you exhibit that self-discipline and you stick with your diet for a month and you see the results, celebrate those. Knowing there's going to be some days where there's ups and downs. But let those positive results reinforce your progress. And the final aspect around self-discipline that spans both physical and financial fitness is it gives you a sense of control. Knowing that you have the self-discipline to stay on a diet, to be consistent with your workout regimen to consistently save a significant portion of your income allows you that sense of control that you have and that you know 
you are in control and can take steps to effectuate change. Area number four, this is about making it measurable. And there's a lot of sub points here because there are so many parallels between these two. So on the physical side, tracking your macros, how much protein, how many carbs, how much fat do you consume in a given day? What is your workout regimen are all highly measurable. And on the financial side, it's about tracking expenses. It's about saving more, spending less. And what tracking allows you to do is essentially objectively look at actual progress versus what you think you do. A lot of people think that they are saving a lot of money. A lot of people think they are eating well. But the more you objectively track it, measure it over time, it gives you a much more accurate, a much more objective, impartial look at what you're actually doing. Also, across both, the more specific you can measure, the better. So a statement like, I'm going to do weight resistance training four days per week from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. and 30 minutes of cardio four times a week is a good statement. It also gives you flexibility to move things around a little bit. Similarly, on the financial side, having a more specific savings goal, I'm going to as an example, I'm going to max out my 401k contributions or I'm going to save X percent of my salary each year. And the good thing is there's a lot of tools that you can use, tools, applications to track your progress. On the physical side, you can look at tracking your macros podcast at www.fitterist.com forward slash 005, where I go over a number of the online tools and apps to track your macros across protein, fat, and carbohydrates. And there is also a plethora of tools to track your financial progress, even if it's a simple Google Sheet, money coming in, money going out. There's lots of tools to track that. The next point is about measuring what matters, which is extremely important. As an example, the scale is not necessarily the measure or the best measure of success on the physical fitness side. It's a data point, but just knowing that muscle weighs more than fat in a singular reading could lead one to inaccurate conclusions about their physical fitness progress. Similarly, on the financial side, understanding what key metrics you want to measure, whether it's wealth accumulation, your frugality in consumption and spending, consistent savings, putting away X percent, whatever makes sense for you and your goals. Another element around measurability is, and this applies again equally across physical and financial, and that is moving from a more emotional place. And emotion can come in the forms of emotional eating. Emotion can contribute to things like emotional spending. In both of those cases, moving to a much more analytical, tracking your macros on your diet plan or sticking to and managing to your budget, shifting that mindset from an emotional place to a much more analytical mindset can have a huge impact. Finally, Having personal responsibility and accountability for your actions or failure to act. If you stick to your diet, you're going to see results over time. If you stick to your savings plan, your spending plan, you're going to see growth over time. But it does require that level of personal responsibility, personal accountability. The fifth major area around physical fitness and financial fitness is around continuous learning. And this includes both learning from the past and applying some of that to the present as well as learning new things. So as an example, on the physical side, you know, exercises that you did in your early 20s might not yield the same results in your 30s and 40s. Just to give you an example, in my case, I used to do flat bench press, but over the years, it took a toll on my shoulders, and now I just do chest press on machines. Still get a great pump, great exercise, great mechanics. I just don't do flat barbell bench press anymore. Similarly, on the investing side, investing strategies that might have worked 10 years ago might not work so well today. And again, from a personal experience, I remember checkings and savings accounts in the early 2000s had pretty good interest rates. You could leave money in there and actually continue to see it grow. But in today's world, that's not going to be the case. Some of the interest rates at large banks are 0.05%, which is probably isn't going to help you too far along the path of financial independence. And again, on the topic of consistency, the workout and diet that works for you 
is the one that you're going to follow. The one that has the right flexibility for you, your schedule, your work-life balance. And on the financial side, the plan that works is the one that you will follow, right? The one that makes the most sense for you. So having that why, understanding what you're trying to do long-term will help reinforce the habits and the decisions that you make along the way. And knowing that setbacks are part of the learning experience. They allow for opportunities for improvement, growing wiser as you age, as you work out smarter. Similarly, on the financial side, learning from your financial miscues. I learned a lot when I was trading commodities. And the number one thing I took away is the risk profile, even in my 20s, late 20s at the time, still didn't match. It was too risky for me and has never been a part of my portfolio since. Was it an interesting ride and did I learn quite a bit? Did I kind of treat the loss there as a tuition expense for learning that segment of the investing world? Yeah, but it was also a setback. But I had to view it as a learning experience so that I could carry it forward and further refine my investment strategy. It's also important to do research, but don't get hung up in the analytics and analyzing every workout and looking at countless and endless potential things you could do. It's far more important to get in the game and start working out, start exercising, start walking, start moving some weight. Similarly, on the financial side, doing some research, but once you start to invest and in managing through downturns and actually seeing the benefits of investing over a longer period of time, the benefits far outweigh the potential and paralysis you could get from endless research. So you can always start small and start learning and take steps. In both the physical and financial arenas, taking advantage of coaches, trainers, financial advisors, provide not only motivation, a little bit of a safety net, certainly individualized feedback and instructions that are tailored just for you, certainly make a lot of sense to accelerate progress, whether that's a personal trainer, nutritionist on the physical fitness side, or a CPA, tax professional, certified financial planner on the financial side. And then, so it's still important to learn new techniques, new strategies, good habits, but keep a fresh perspective, try new exercises, but re also remember the basics that built the foundation. Similarly, in the financial world, there are a lot of investment choices. But remember that sometimes the boring, kind of unsexy investments often serve as a great baseline foundation for your portfolio in its growth over time. And the sixth and final area of the parallels between physical and financial fitness is that it is customized for you. It is personalized to meet your needs, your goals, your lifestyle, your schedule, and your priorities. So what helps here is to increase your own self-awareness. Know how you respond emotionally to things like risk and reward. You have to find out what works for you and your lifestyle. And again, this spans both physical and financial. There's no perfect single way to invest. You need to tailor your profile to what makes sense for yourself and your goals. And remember, keeping it fresh is important. So looking at a diverse array of different exercises, just like you would look at a diversified portfolio in the financial world of investments, will allow you to decrease risk, keep your fun and excitement, and ultimately keep you engaged for the long term as you reach your goals. Probably one of the most important things to remember is that your only competition is yourself. It's that person in the mirror. When you start to idealistic scenarios, either in the physical or financial world, instead of focusing on making steady progress toward your goals that make sense for you and your lifestyle, you'll be far better off. Just another note as well is you can start to look for synergies where Taking one action positively impacts both physical and financial areas. So an example of this would be saving money by buying healthy groceries and maybe packing food and meals versus eating out less. In this case, you're eating healthier on one end of the spectrum, and you're also saving money by not going out to eat as often. So it's really around prioritizing exercise and food choices on one side of the spectrum and on the financial side, the ability to prioritize spending choices 
those might be areas of synergy. So in each of these six areas, ideally one starts early, is consistent, executes on a plan-driven holistic approach, really leveraging the mindset, discipline, behaviors that they're focused on to help them feel better and live better. Remember that self-worth is not equal to net worth. Remember that developing an awareness to formulate a plan is an important step in taking action. And tailor your plan and habits around what works for you. As you continue to learn about yourself, this isn't a single snapshot in time. This is something that will continue to live and breathe and grow as you learn more about yourself, your body, and your and develop your habits over time. And remember, it's hard to change. It takes effort. It takes time. But it's also completely attainable. The key is a commitment and a decision to take that first step. And at the end of the day, your physical and financial health lead to a richer overall life. And I hope these six areas at least highlight the impact that your physical and financial fitness levels can have on one another, again, to bring you a richer and healthier life. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterest Show. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterest Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterest Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterest Show. My name is Chris Frown, and make it a magical day. <laughs>